Welcome back to another episode of the Wyatt Sharp Show. Today, my guest is Ahmed Hewson. He is Canada's Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development. Uh, hello, Minister, and thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Wyatt. It's a pleasure to be on your show. So um, I generally start off with just a simple question of why did you get involved in politics? And uh, so why did you want to initially run uh, to be the Member of Parliament for York Southwestern, I believe? Well, you know, uh, Wyatt, uh, that's a really important question. And uh, I, I was already involved in the community doing a, a, a number of things. One of the things that I enjoyed a lot in my community of York Southwestern doing is, uh, is uh, tutoring kids, um, high school kids, uh, kids in uh, middle school. And I enjoyed doing that. And that allowed me to really connect with the community. And before that, I was doing, I had done a lot of work on housing, making sure that uh, people uh, had uh, decent housing and uh, that our community was really uh, one that had a voice on all the issues that matter to them. And, you know, when you work on community safety, we worked on community safety, we worked on creating jobs for people, helping, uh, making sure that uh, youth had activities after school, but also um, uh, working to help kids who were struggling in school to succeed through to a really interesting program called Pathways to Education. So all of those things really taught me something that I hadn't known before, that politics and, and representation makes a big difference and that politics can be a force for good, that politics can result in, in really good outcomes for community. And, and uh, But even then, I, I hadn't initially thought about running for office and becoming an, an MP. It was much later after I had, I had become a lawyer and... Uh, gone back to school, become a lawyer, practiced law. Uh, it was only after a while that I saw that I was really concerned that the very community services, library, com the community library, public transit, social housing that I benefited from, all those services were being cut and they were being threatened. So I felt like uh, I should speak up and I should uh, run for office to try to protect those services, uh, not just for our generation, but hopefully even expand them for the future generation uh, of, of young people like yourself. And, uh, and that's why I got involved and I'm happy that I did because now I'm able to work on all, the, all, the, all of those issues that are really, really important to the community. As I said, those really important community services that help people to get ahead, right? Okay, and so I wanna um, ask you about, um, obviously in budget 2021, funding to reduce childcare costs um, down to $10 a day was one of the really big yes. highlights. And so the government has already um, reached deals with British Columbia, Yukon and Nova Scotia. Yes. So um, when will people in those three provinces and then people in, um, in other provinces start to feel um, it easing and start to actually feel um, their child care cost decrease? Because obviously there is a bit of a process that goes with yes. it. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I'm, I really commend you for uh, noticing that and for, for really uh, looking at that very carefully. In British Columbia and Nova Scotia, parents will see a, 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 a very quick change uh, in their fees by the end of next year. So by the end of 2022, the childcare fees will be cut in half. Uh, so if they're paying, you know, forty-four dollars now per child per day, it'll come down to twenty-two dollars a day. That means twenty-two dollars will go back into the pockets of of those parents every single day. So that's British Columbia and Nova Scotia. In terms of Yukon, and we signed the agreement with Yukon two days ago. Uh, they're already there. They they were already um, at ten dollars a day. Uh, but what they will do is because of our investments, the federal government's investments in Yukon and their investments, they'll be able to create more spaces so that more parents and more kids can benefit from $10 a day childcare. So, you know, the affordability piece is important, like bringing the fees down to 10 bucks is important, but it's, you know, it's not, it, it, it doesn't mean much if you, if you don't have access to that space. So we have to create more spaces so that more kids, all kids in fact, can benefit from that $10 day childcare. So the short answer to your question is British Columbia and Nova Scotia, they'll see uh, a reduction by half by the end of next year. And then 
work towards ten dollars within five years. In Yukon, they're already there. It's just we need to expand those spaces so that more kids can benefit in Yukon. Okay, and there's been um, uh, a lot of concern um, that it will be harder to reach a deal with a province like um, provinces like Alberta, Ontario, Manitoba, and, and other conservative provinces because of their uh, government. And generally, conservatives will try to aim for um, less government programs. So, how will um, your government work to secure a deal with these provinces that have a uh, conservative government? Because obviously, the government might be different in each province, but people needing um, this support really isn't so, different. In so why province. just, that, that's a very important question, but let me, let me just uh, remind you, the first deal that we signed with a province uh, on this Canada-wide early learning and childcare was with a, w w in British Columbia with an NDP government. So we don't have to be in, in the same political party or the same philosophy in order to understand the importance of this. And I have to tell you that uh, our approach, you said, how are you going to get this done? We are negotiating with every province and territory. And we're doing that very openly, very transparently, and in good faith. So we're putting all our cards on the table. And we're saying to these provinces and territories, we are investing in a huge way and we're there for the long term. We're there for permanently. Uh, and so, and this is good for all of us. And ultimately, you know what Canadians want us to do? They want the federal government, the government of Canada, and all the provinces and territories to work together. They want us to work together because at the end of the day, what is this about? It's about those kids getting a better start in life. It's about those parents saving money, but also getting access to uh, an affordable childcare space. That's what it's about. So when it comes to our negotiations with Alberta, they're not gonna be any different from our negotiations with Nova Scotia or, or British Columbia, or Newfoundland, or Labrador, or whoever. Uh, we're saying to them, look, we, uh, we want to cut fees. I'm sure parents in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba and everywhere else want lower fees, lower childcare fees. I've spoken to Minister uh, Rebecca Schultz in Alberta, who's the minister responsible for early learning and childcare, she agrees with me that we need a more affordable system. So it's, it's just a matter of uh, sitting down and figuring this out together. Now, we're not saying that every single province and every single territory has to have the exact same deal with us. We know that there's some flexibilities that and, and variations based on different parts of the country. So for example, the early learning and childcare system in, in Yukon is very different from the one in Alberta or Ontario, right? So we have to take that into consideration. But I think ultimately, uh, we will hopefully get there because uh, we already have, by the way, we're not starting from zero. We already have good childcare agreements uh, through, through agreements that we signed in 2017 that we've been renewing uh, over the years with all provinces and territories, including Alberta and Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So I have faith that uh, we'll get this done. This is just the next step. It's a big step, but it's the next step to something that we've already been doing. Okay, and what about in a province like Quebec where they have decently affordable childcare uh, already? I think people um, in Quebec are wondering <laughs> if they will still receive the funding and if your government will still try to reach a deal with that province to create more child care spaces, for example, like you said, with Yukon. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Quebec is, has been a leader in Canada on affordable child care. Uh, and they've seen the benefits of that, right? I mean, Quebec, uh, the Quebec system has really helped families and children to get ahead there and help the economy to grow the best performing economy in Canada. Uh, yes, Quebec has achieved an affordable childcare system. What they need is more spaces. They need more affordable spaces. There's 51,000 kids in Quebec who are on wait lists to get into an affordable childcare space. So we need to create more spaces together with Quebec. They also need more teachers, more early childhood educators. And so um, our new, our new uh, Canada-wide early learning and childcare system will also benefit parents in Quebec and children in Quebec. So we, again, we're going to sit down with Quebec. We know that they're leaders in affordability. 
but I think they, they, they also see an opportunity here to benefit from this uh, new, next chapter. Okay, and so I want to ask you about a topic that um, is uh, lots of people have different opinions on it, but um, and it's the possibility that a lot of people are speculating of an upcoming election. And so um, obviously, you know, no party really wants an election at this stage. I think every party has at least said that. Um, but many people are um, saying that, um, again, that there's the possibility of an upcoming election. So what would you say to someone who is um, who, who doesn't want an election right now and um, and it's someone who's concerned that they may have to go to the polls to vote during COVID? We've been working on this issue of uh, affordable child care since 2017. So this is not, not new. Um, um, parents want affordable child care now. Like this is something that is common across the country. If you talk to parents in Newfoundland, Labrador, if you go to Yukon, if you go to the Northwest Territories, if you go to British Columbia and, and everywhere in between, from coast to coast to coast, parents are, are saying, this is something we need to do now. They can't wait any, anymore. Childcare fees are very high in so many parts of the country. Uh, we're working on uh, making sure that uh, we deal with the housing crisis in Canada, making sure that more people have more access to affordable and safe and quality housing. These are the issues that we're focusing on and, and, and the, the agreements that we're signing, the negotiations we're involved in, that's, that's been our focus. Um, and, and we're working uh, very, very hard on those. Uh, obviously, you know, we are, uh, we are a minority government and uh, in a minority parliament situation, you can have an election at any time based on what, uh, what, what the other political parties do. But we're focused on, on, on delivering for Canadians, whether it's on affordable childcare, whether it's on housing, or whether it is making sure that we take care of our seniors. And that's what we're focused on. Okay, and so um, you mentioned at the beginning um, of the interview that um, part of the reason that you got involved in politics was uh, for housing. And so um, I want to ask you about housing. So obviously there's a big issue with housing right now and the cost of housing in June of 2020. The average cost of a house was five hundred and thirty-nine thousand dollars in Canada, and now the average cost is nearly seven hundred thousand dollars. So that's an increase of around twenty-six percent. So, um, what what support is your government providing, and how can um, Canadians who who are looking to move or, or even first-time uh, home buyers be able to um, buy a new house when the cost is that high? That's a very good question. We so we have uh, something called the National Housing Strategy, which our government uh, brought in in 2017. That program has grown from $40 billion now to over $72 billion. And it is about addressing all the different kinds of housing needs uh, for Canadians. So from people who are on the street uh, through the Rapid Housing Initiative and Reaching Home and other programs. And then we have the, the, uh, the co-investment fund, which builds deeply affor affordable housing with uh, nonprofit organizations and municipalities. And then we have the rental construction financing initiative, which builds more affordable rental housing across the country. I just announced recently a project in, uh, in, um, uh, in Coquitlam, British Columbia, where we are financing 308 affordable rental units. 100 of those units or apartments will be deeply affordable. Uh, for the most vulnerable people in our community. And then you mentioned home ownership. We have a really nice program called the First Time Home Buyer Incentive, where the, the government of Canada will actually help first time home buyers to be able to access their dream of home ownership. We know there's more work to be done. We understand, of course, the need is, is, is that much greater, but we are, we're not only bringing federal leadership back into housing, but we've invested so much into housing and we'll continue to do that. This is a really important issue for Canadians. Okay, and so part of um, your portfolio is obviously um, children. And so this pandemic has taken a major toll on the mental health of Canadians, but I wanna talk specifically about the youth demographic. So yep. how will your government work to uh, provide uh, support, support. Um, to support youth and to support their mental health? So uh, Wyatt, unfortunately, this will be the last question because I have to run, but we have done a lot to make sure that we're there for young people, especially during the pandemic. So as you know, we provided a one-time uh, payment uh, through the Canada Child Benefit last year in May, 
uh, of up to 300 bucks a child for each child receiving the Canada Child Benefit. And then in July, we increased the Canada Child Benefit permanently uh, last year. And then this year, again, we increased it again to keep up with the cost of living uh, through the Emergency Community Support Fund last year, $350 million we invested to help community organizations help the most vulnerable people being affected by COVID and, and the impact of COVID. And obviously one of those target populations is, is young people and kids. We gave a little bit more money to kids help home to help kids who, uh, who are in challenging situations. Our housing uh, uh, investments also prioritize women and children fleeing domestic violence so that they can have a safe place to call home. Uh, so we, I mean, th this pandemic has been particularly hard on children and we are doing everything that we can to make sure that, uh, that we're there for them. This year we're providing an additional up to $1,200 per child for each child receiving the kind of a child benefit who's under the age of six, because those are some extra costs, right? So in addition to the permanent increase for all kids from, uh, from, from zero to 17. So we're doing a lot and we'll continue to do more because we know that uh, the pandemic has really, has really been hard on kids. All right, well, thanks again, Minister, for joining me today and it's been absolutely great talking with you. No problem, thank you so much, Wyatt. It's, a, it's been quite the pleasure to, uh, to speak with you and I really wanna commend you for your knowledge and your ability to keep up with uh, the latest news and, and your knowledge of the issues that matter. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. Bye okay. now.